Our question tonight, how will the latest advances in robotics change our lives and our evolution? To debate that, Michael Belfiore, scientist journalist, author of the Department of Mad Scientists, Hod Lipson, director of Cornell University's Computational Synthesis Lab, Eliezer Yudkowsky, artificial intelligence theorist and co-founder of the Singularity Institute in Palo Alto, California, and Cory Doctorow, the London, UK-based blogger and science fiction writer. And it's great to welcome you three from way out of town here, and you sort of back home. You're from where originally? From Toronto. Toronto, I've heard of it. I hear it's a nice place. Michael, let's get started here, first of all. You've written a book about cutting-edge robotics research that's going on at the U.S. Defense Department. What are they doing, for example? Well, first of all, you have to realize that uh, about the single biggest funder of robotics and artificial intelligence is the U.S. military, uh, be that as it may. So, so they have a very specific agenda, which do trickle over into the civilian world. Um, you sound like that's an ominous thing we should be worried about. Well, not necessarily. They created no? the internet. Uh, but, but they also are creating uh, assistants that can learn from us, uh, computerized assistants. They want commanders to be able to better access information. They're creating cars that drive themselves. They want vehicles to go through war zones without uh, harming drivers, but that can help us too on civilian roads. And they're also creating robots that can patch people up on trauma. They call it trauma pod. So if you're in a car accident uh, or the specific application they have is if you get shot up, a robot can patch you up without human intervention. So those are some of the things they're working hmm. on now. So most people, when they hear Defense Department spending, they automatically go to a negative place. You tell us it ain't necessarily so. That was my intention writing this book, The Department of Mad Scientists. You know, I realized there was a lot of useful application coming out of this one defense department agency that we were using as civilians, GPS, the internet, things like this. And robotics is a very large part of this. So I think we're going to see some of this coming into our automobiles and, and other places at home, too. Well, just before I ask you a question, I, wanna, I guess we should say there's cutting edge and then there's cutting edge. And I want to take a look at the kind of robots that you build. We're going to play a clip of you speaking at the TED conference. So we'll do that and then come back and chat. Roll tape, please, Michael. Here's a, here's a physical uh, robot that we actually uh, have a population of brains uh, competing or evolving on the machine. It's like a rodeo show. They all get a ride on the machine, and they get rewarded for how, uh, how fast or how far they can make the machine move forward. Okay, a little excerpt from you two and a half years ago at the TED conference. Here's what I've been reading. Robots still cannot do the following. Two-year-old child being able to tell a difference between a cat and a dog. Robots can't do that. A four-year-old's ability to understand natural language. Can't do that yet. A six-year-old's ability to tie his or her shoelaces. Can't do that. An eight-year-old's social intelligence. Can't do that. Which of those problems are you trying to solve? Well, actually, you know, uh, you can get a robot to do any one of these problems tomorrow. You can even get a robot to solve all four of them tomorrow. But the challenge is for, to get a robot to solve a new problem that it hasn't been uh, trained to do. And that's what uh, humans, and that's what animals, that's what biology is so good at. It's, uh, it is dealing with, uh, with new situations, adapting to, to new circumstances, to uh, things changing, it's uh, the adaptability. So any specific problem you want, you can build a robot uh, to solve. Not everything, but, but, but many things. It's the ability to solve uh, uh, a general problem. The general AI uh, challenge is what really uh, what we're after. Okay, more on that in a bit. I want to play some more tape here. Uh, Corey, this Christmas, parents are going to be able to buy their children the following for presents. Again, roll tape, please. Okay, robotic toys. I'm wondering though, Corey, does the thought of being surrounded by these kinds of robotic devices appeal to you? Yeah, I guess that it's, it's, it's um, 
when I picture this stuff, it's, it's after life, after the, the wrapping paper's come off. I picture it, you know, sort of three months later, lost under the sofa and, and <laughs> you know, with the batteries missing. What I find really interesting about this is not that um, our kids might have some robot toys, but rather that when this stuff ends up in huge mountains in the surplus stores and uh, kind of just kicking around as raw material for um, makers and scientists, what they'll figure out how to do with it. These things clearly have their origin in something called the bristle bot, which started off uh, makers ha literally hacking toothbrushes with little uh, motors that made them run around. And the bristle bot is, has evolved into this commercial product. But this commercial product will, I think, then turn back into another generation of bristle bots that hackers over the net will figure out new things to do with. I'm told that robotic pets as companions are very popular, in particular with Japanese seniors. What do you think of that? Well, I think that just because people in Japan are interested in it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good leading indicator of what the rest of the world is going to do. I mean, Finnish teenagers and Japanese seniors are notorious for adopting things that are uh, externally interesting, but uh, wildly improbable to catch on with the rest of the world. Hmm. Eliezer, uh, machines may not know how to tie shoelaces, but one thing they are pretty good at is playing chess. And I want to get your opinion on what happened on May 11th, 1997, when Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov. How important a date in history was that? Um, I think it's uh, probably not that surprising a date in history. Um, there was a sort of steady increase in the chess uh, playing ability of programs. Um, Deep Blue jumped a bit ahead by having a lot of specialized hardware. Um, we made, we made a big deal about them uh, surpassing the best in human ability because we're, we tend to be a very egocentric creature, so we think of human level ability as this, this grand threshold, but you know, they beat Kasparov and then they just uh, kept right on going on pretty much the same curve, and today you can get a uh, chess playing program that runs on your ordinary personal computer instead of the specialized supercomputer that IBM built and is 400 points stronger than the uh, greatest uh, human player ever, so in other words, they can uh, pretty much um, they, they can crush our grandmasters pretty easily now. But obviously some people saw that as a sign that the apocalypse was upon us. Did you regard it that way? Um, it, it, it was predictable. It uh, didn't really have much consequences beyond chess. Um, it was ultimately, uh, ultimately it was a public relations event rather than a grand triumph of AI. Hmm. Okay. Michael, you mentioned earlier that the Pentagon was working on a number of things, including cars that would drive themselves. And of course they're looking at it from a military standpoint. You suggested there could be a civilian application for this as well. How far away do you think we are from cars driving on Herb Street in Waterloo with nobody in them? Technically, we're very close. I went to this event that DARPA sponsored called the Urban Challenge, where they had a bunch of cars all driving around, built by all different companies, people, people in their garages. They, were, they obeyed traffic laws. They stopped at stop signs. They avoided each other at intersections. And they did this very well. It was a very clearly defined problem uh, that this is what robots are good at. The, the, the issue, it seems to me, is more social than technological for, for that application. How so? I met, a, I met a, a person there at the Urban Challenge who represented an insurance company. And he was there uh, to scope out the implications for his industry, and trying to figure out uh, what, who's at fault when a robot car has an accident, someone is injured, or property is damaged. And these are things that are starting to concern policymakers and people like insurance executives. And in fact, there are laws in the books that prevent autonomous driving. So we, we already have vehicles that can uh, regulate distance, uh, you know, adaptive cruise control, it, it regulate the distance from another car. They can help you avoid accidents by vibrating your steering wheel if you start to depart from your lane. Um, but but they, they are not allowed to actually wrest control of the vehicle hmm. from the human driver if they start to depart from that lane. They can just warn the vehicle, uh, warn the driver, and that's because of a social problem. It, the, the lawmakers don't trust the robots. I guess it would be a crisis for the insurance industry, though, that if these robots got so good and there were no more accidents, be a lot of people out of work, wouldn't there? I think, I mean, I th the, the implications for this are, are tremendous, and I think that's why it's inevitable that this will happen. Uh, more people die on the highways every year than through just about any other cause. I mean, it's tens of thousands of people. Um, and robots have the ability to sense their environment in 360 degrees and it, at all times. So we only have one set of eyes. We can look forward. Someone distracts us, a kid in the back. We turn mm. for an instant. There's an accident. Never mind that. I bet they can text and talk on a cell phone at the same it, time, well, too. Well, exactly. So imagine yeah. driving to work w without having to pay attention to the road. Huh. 
Yeah. What do you see, Hod, coming in, I mean, dazzle us, 10 or 15 years from now, what do you imagine out there? No, oh, there's so many things, but even just, just, uh, I, uh, just to echo uh, this, this idea, I think that a lot of the prob problems are social and can be, you know, with policy can be changed. For example, if you had, uh, just like you have HOV lanes, uh, if you had uh, autopilot lanes, that you drive your car <laughs> in and it's hands-free for 20 miles and you drive off of it when you... Uh, when, when you want to uh, start driving, there's, there's solutions out there that are actually not technological, they're more political, if you like. Uh, and uh, and uh, so the future is uh, actually closer, I think, than, than what we imagine in many areas. On the other hand, some things are more difficult. Uh, and uh, so it's really difficult to, to kind of predict uh, what's going to happen. One thing that I'm very excited about uh, uh, is the ability of, of robots to kind of model or understand what humans or other robots are thinking, are trying to do. And I think that that's something that humans, for example, are very good at, uh, something that's called theory of mind uh, uh, psychology, in psychology. You know, when you're talking to somebody, you are uh, trying to understand what they're thinking. You're doing that right now, trying to understand what I'm thinking. I'm trying to think, uh, to understand if you are understanding me. <laughs> and so forth. So this, this, uh, this is something people do all the time. But not robots. Uh, robots can't do that today. And that's yeah. one of the things that makes them awkward. Make them, uh, you know, they don't uh, communicate well. They won't get out of the way if they need to. Uh, mm -hmm. They won't jump to help you. They can't kind of read your mind. And that's a, such a fundamental thing uh, in human interaction that robots can't do. And that, uh, th I think that's a big uh, barrier. But we're trying to, beginning to make progress on that and the ability of robots to read people or even to make themselves more readable to people. Hmm. It's a bi-directional thing and I think once we can do that we'll, we'll move ahead. Corey. Yeah, I want to get back to this notion of autonomous cars. I think that the idea that the problem of autonomous cars is social and that once that's solved we'll, we'll only have a technical problem to solve ignores the, the social problem hidden in the technical problem. I mean, a, a, route, a highway filled with autonomous cars would all be making assumptions that all the other cars were playing, were playing fair. Um, and there would be some advantage that would accrue to someone who modified his or her car to not play fair, right? To, to essentially uh, take advantage of the fact that other cars say defer if it looks like you're losing control, to always look like you're losing control so that you can get the best lane and move as fast <laughs> as possible, which creates a whole new raft of social problems like maybe technology mandates that control what kind of firmware you can load in your car, or a mandate that requires that cars be designed so that users can't modify them, you know, the, 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 the every, every bonnet well shut, um, uh, you know, source code signing by the police and so on. Uh, 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 this, this is an entirely new realm of social problems that are probably even more thorny than the social problems related to, you know, the mere uh, concerns of an insurance adjuster. Eliezer, what do you want to see in the next 10 years? Next 10 years? Um, well, I think there's uh, quite a bit of lag be between the, uh, the bright new ideas just coming out of the laboratory, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, sort of occurring to the theorists and uh, when they finally get perfected enough to uh, show up in the laboratory. Uh, next 10 years, I think that uh, I'll, I'll actually go along with robotic cars. There's a huge problem. Our, our AI technology is finally getting good enough to solve it. Uh, uh, 50,000 lives per year um, beca uh, for, because the, the, uh, the limit of uh, human ability just isn't good enough. Um, and the, the, the sort of uh, the main problem uh, that I would worry about is if there's a bug in the code and you get an entire highway full of cars all making the same mistake at the same time. <laughs> that sounds like a good movie, actually. I think we'd like to see that. How far away are we? we? We know right now that if you talk to a computer, it will essentially type out what you say. How long before a computer will type out what you're thinking? Um, are you asking me about direct brain computer interfaces or its ability to understand what you said? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see. So the, the, uh, the, the technology to interface uh, directly to the brain and tell what you're thinking is in progress. Um, that might be another thing that we'd see in, in uh, five years, or it might be something that we'll see in 20 years. Um, having a computer understand what you mean is uh, getting much closer to the sort of grand challenge of AI where it actually is ap approaching humans in depth of understanding and generality of understanding and ability to learn new things. Um, I, natural language has generally been the, the problem held up as the one that you can't really fake. I mean, you can fake it to some extent, but the, um, 
but, but no one has ever actually managed to give a really good appearance of understanding without actual understanding. So there's mm -hmm. lots of AI problems that you can program, especially as uh, Hode observed, but um, to, to the uh, natural language does not see actually seem to be one of those problems. Corey? Yeah, but if you, if you don't care about it being perfect, if it's good enough, then you get Google autocomplete, where you start to type a, a, a query into Google, and Google just looks at you know, a trillion other queries and statistically guesses which query that you, you're, you're about to enter in, and sometimes with comic effect, uh, but, but most of the time, uh, pretty good. Uh, I, I think that um, you know, the perfect is often the enemy of the good when we talk about these AI things. Mm -hmm. Is it, do we, do we really need machine interfaces that are so smart that we forget we're talking to a machine? Or is it enough to, to, to have a machine that is frequently helpful and mostly ch attains that by counting a bunch of human decisions that, that actual other people have made and then just using those as, the, as a kind of knowledge base to make guesses about what we might do in the future? Mm -hmm. Michael. You know, DARF is working on this problem is, is a, and it has a greater implications than just uh, searching something in Google because they're trying to create a, a system that can scan communications, if for lack of a better word, from the enemy in one language and translate it, first of all, understand it, and then translate it into a form that uh, the so-called good guys will interpret in their own language. And the problems they're getting into are, are how do you determine how accurate they are? So they developed a test and say, well, it has to be 95% accurate. And just as a uh, sort of a check, they hired some human translators to do the test, figure, okay, those guys are expert translators, the robots, will be compared to them and we'll see which is more accurate. And the humans were not as accurate as they wanted the robot to be. So the, the problem was, how do you measure the accuracy? And in this case, well, one word choice in the wrong place could result in a, a real problem mm -hmm. when you're talking about a conflict or a military situation. Indeed. Hold. I think often we, we kind of place the bar very high when we're talking about what machines should be able to do so it counts as artificial intelligence. You know, I think a lot of People can get by uh, often in a conversation without understanding much, just saying uh-huh at the right time and kind of <laughs> hoping that nobody notices. So I think uh, there was this, uh, this program called Eliza back in the 60s, which is a kind of classic AI uh, story, uh, which uh, did something like that. It kind of collected words, some very st simple statistical matching, and it could fool quite a lot of people into, uh, it acted like a psychologist and it uh, fooled people into uh, spilling their hearts into the machine. Uh, and they were thinking, they were talking to a real psychologist. So I think you can, uh, you know, the whole thing about understanding, does a computer really understand what is understanding is a very sticky uh, subject. Tell me this. It, Presumably the day will come in the not too distant future where you will be able to converse with a computer and the computer will understand. This is a particularly good question for people who live in Canada. What if you have a very thick accent? Is that yet another obstacle to be overcome? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this area, but certainly accents. Uh, you were talking now about speech recognition, more of identifying words, words in context. That definitely makes it uh, more difficult. But that's, I think, one of the things that are well-defined enough that there's a fantastic uh, progress on. That's Corey? I think one of the, one of the great risks here is, is which domain we expect computers to behave well in and how critical that domain is. So for example, if you're talking about identifying the potential guilt of a human being and plunging them into the kind of Orwellian nightmare of the night war on terror, we, we probably want a lot more human intervention there than, than machine intervention, especially since we kind of have a bias to thinking, well, if the algorithm says that you are statistically likely to be a terrorist because you bought some hummus and you did these three bank transfers in a row, it's essentially this kind of war on the unexpected. Um, that, uh, that that is this really nightmarish outcome. Whereas if a computer, if you type in, what do I do if my daughter eats a marble, and Google automatically completes that as, what do I do if my daughter eats maple sugar, um, <laughs> it's not a big deal to backspace over it and correct it. So uh, this, this bias to thinking that AI is sort of stronger than it actually is, is probably one of the biggest risks. And when I hear DARPA talking about automatically detecting terrorists, that's when you know every hair on my body stands up. You just use an acronym. Say what it is again. DARPA is that DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project okay. Agency. While you've got the floor, let's let's follow up with one of your projects. You wrote something called iRobot, and mm -hmm. just so people aren't confused, this is not the Will Smith movie. This is the Cory Doctorow book. Mm -hmm. Your protagonist lives in a world of humanoid robots, and there's a moment where he holds a toy soldier in his hand and he asks, "How long had humans been making people, striving to bring them to life?" 
We've used this expression AI many times already tonight, artificial intelligence, and let's now play a clip from Steven Spielberg's movie of the same title, AI, and then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please, Michael. I propose that we build a robot child who can love, a robot child who will genuinely love the parent or parents it imprints on with a love that will never end. A child substitute mecca. But a mecca with a mind, with neuronal feedback. You see, what I'm suggesting is that love will be the key by which they acquire a kind of subconscious, never before achieved, an inner world of metaphor, of intuition, of self-motivated reasoning, of dreams. A robot that dreams. Yes. How exactly do we pull this off? <laughs> you know, it occurs to me, um, with all this animus existing against mechas today, it isn't simply a question of creating a robot who can love, but isn't the real conundrum can you get a human to love them back? Hmm. Is that the future? Well, I think that to the extent that like high fructose corn syrup is the natural outcome of like refining sugar, mm -hmm. that creating these incredibly neurotic, dependent, you know, uh, uh, love-struck children who never mature and who never deliver the much more difficult but ultimately much more rewarding pleasures of an adult child, maybe the future of robotics too. I think that, you know, like a lot of science fiction that purports to predict the future, AI tells us a lot about the present. It tells us a lot about, for example, in this clip, how we think about kids and how we think kids kind of get disappointing and, and, and unlovable as they, as they turn into adolescents and teenagers, this kind of war on children that, that we're in the middle of. Um, and, and really, I, I, I think that it doesn't really tell us a lot about the future, but it sure does tell us a lot about the present. It's kind of an indictment of the present, really. Eliezer, what's uh, the singularity threshold? Because that's involved here. Well, the singularity is a term that's been used with a lot of different meanings by a lot of different people. Um, in, th in this particular case, the, the meaning that you're probably interested in is um, when artificial intelligence becomes smarter than we are, on the theory that a future that contains beings smarter than we are is fundamentally weird in a way that a future that contains flying cars or interplanetary travel or even super medicine is, is not quite as weird. Um, the uh, the uh, acquisition of uh, computers by uh, of emotions by computers. I actually tend to think that emotions will, if anything, prove to be a simpler problem than intelligence because emotions have been around for tens of millions of years before there were any humans on the scene. They're evolutionarily much older and probably simpler compared to intelligence. The singularity threshold moment. Do you embrace or fear that moment? Um, it depends on how exactly the AI was designed. You know, we only deal with other humans all day. So we have a very narrow conception of what minds can be like. The space of possible AIs is probably immensely wider than the space of uh, possible humans. In a sense, when you say artificial intelligence, you're really just talking about all the other possibilities in mind design space except for humans. So I think that there are certainly minds in that mind design space that I would be happy to welcome into the communal embrace of intelligent life. And then there are minds in that space which uh, I would desperately prefer not to, to, to see not being created. For example? Um, the, the mind that doesn't love you, doesn't hate you, um, but does want to answer some obscure math question and builds lots and lots of computers to answer that math question. And you are made out of resources which it can use for something else. <laughs> Got it. How far around the corner is a world where the machines are smarter than we are? Well, I think there's, uh, again, going back to this idea of multiple dimensions of intelligence, which we know uh, exist uh, in humans. So you can't, uh, you can't answer that in general. You can, you can take any particular area of intelligence or any dimension, and you can start asking that more specifically. So in, in many areas, machines are better than, than humans. Uh, chess, for example, which we touched uh, mm -hmm. on uh, earlier, machines are better than humans. Uh, is that a uh, you know, world-changing event? I don't think so. But uh, there are many areas which uh, it's surprising to see. And uh, you know, one of the big areas, I think, that are interesting, especially for science, is kind of data mining. The idea that, you can, that a computer can look at vast amount of data that we're all flooded with and find area and find things that uh, uh, that uh, scientists uh, or analysts can't see, I think is, is, is that's happening all the time. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And 
I think that the really, the big challenge is, again, not in any specific area, but can we have a machine, uh, an intelligence that can adapt to something new that hasn't been programmed, that hasn't mm -hmm. been, hasn't encountered before. That's, I think, one of the, the, the really challenging frontiers of, of robotics today, and we still have a ways to go there. And Michael, as we look to that world where we cross the singularity threshold, there's no guarantee, obviously, that that's going to be a world that will be friendly to humans, right? No, and it's not. And, um, part of that reason is that we have all these purpose-built machines that are designed to do very specific things that you were talking about. The, the, the robots are not adaptable the way we are. So it depends on the intention of the maker. If you want a machine that's going to go out and kill people, you'll get a machine that does that. And there's a lot of money going into that research. If you want a machine that will patch people up who, who have medical problems or have trauma, you know, extreme physical trauma, we'll get that. And uh, if you want a, a car that will, you just get into and you say, please drive me to so-and-so's you know, so -and -so's house, then you'll get that. And, uh, you'll have all these very purpose-built machines that will they converge into one general purpose machine that, that acts like a human being? I don't know. <laughs> and that's where we are. Eliezer? I think there's, uh, I, I think it's not safe to assume that AIs um, have a automatically, without any additional effort being involved, have the, uh, in have the values of the maker built into it. I think that's actually a very deep problem which is solvable, but which we do not presently know how to solve, and which we probably ought to solve. Hood. Yeah, I think there's, it's interesting that uh, you know, we, we keep making this assumption that there's a designer, that there's a human designer that's going to make the robot and is going to control uh, what it's going to think. And you know, uh, for years, there's this myth that we'll build three laws into a robot. They're going to do this and that. And the, f the truth of the matter is that uh, the way robotics is progressing today, we're not going to be able to program these machines. They learn. They, uh, they uh, learn how to learn. They experience things. They create their own experiences. They, uh, they come to their own conclusions. So we won't have that much control over what they do or don't do as we would like to think. Corey. So I have a little science fictional prediction about that. Um, so for a machine to learn how to learn, it needs to be able to evaluate whether it's behaving more or less intelligently at any given moment. And if a machine were capable of making that judgment, it would already be intelligent. So the only way to, the only thing for it to sharpen its teeth against are actual intelligent beings, e.g. us. Except we've got other things to do. So my, my science fictional prediction is that a spam bot will become artificially intelligent because it has lots of opportunities to try and fool people into thinking that it's uh, uh, an intelligent being, specifically a human being. Um, and uh, lots of instances in which human beings will go, wait a second, you're a bot, delete, delete, delete. Uh, the one that survives deletion the longest is the one that is most intelligent. So there's your mechanism for compelling human beings to evaluate intelligence. Well, although evolution did evolve spontaneously uh, in the natural world, so it doesn't need uh, another intelligence to copy from. But that presumes that there's some survival advantage to behaving right. intelligently that accrues to the AI. Um, and uh, it may be that the most uh, survival advantage for an AI is to not behave intelligently. So if it's going to become intelligent, it needs some, some other external uh, non-natural selector. It needs an artificial selector for intelligence. Uh, so we've been talking so far about replicating humans, some. The future may also not just be limited to that. It may also include us becoming them, cyborgs. Let's bring up the re results of this 2009 poll by Zogby International. People were surveyed and asked, do you want to be a cyborg? <laughs> Would you want to have the internet wired directly into your brain? Only 13% of the people at this point say yes, 82% say no. Next question. Would you agree to have a computer chip implanted in your brain if it would make you immune to disease? A quarter of those surveyed said yes, a little over half said no, still almost a quarter aren't sure about that one. Couple of more, would you agree to have a computer chip implanted in your brain if it would provide you a storehouse of knowledge? Again, about a quarter saying yes, 58% no, about a fifth not sure. And one more, would you agree to have a computer chip implanted in your brain which would provide you with entertainment? And on this one, only 6% say yes, 86% say no, 9% not sure. Now, let me just turn around here and talk to our audience for a second. Stand by, guys. Uh, let's do a little survey of the room here. Uh, Michael, a wide shot if you would. There we go. How many of you would agree to have a chip implanted in your brain 
if it would enable you to do any of those things we just talked about, provide you more knowledge, provide you with entertainment, avoid having certain diseases. Hands up, please. Who would go for that? Huh. In this room, it looks like about half. Okay, hands down. How many people say no? Okay, a little more than half. You are, you are not representative of Zogby's universe. <laughs> this is a very hip science, science -y crowd tonight. Okay, we have a long way to go, obviously, as these figures indicate, before people are willing to merge with machines. Are you surprised to see this? I'm not. I mean, one of the early, I keep going back to DARPA, the subject of my book, because DARPA has funded a lot of this research. But the guy who created the computer mouse, Douglas Engelbart, a DARPA researcher, had this vision of man-machine symbiosis. And that was back in the early 60s, early to mid-60s. His vision was that machines would not only become more capable of interacting with us, but we would become more capable of interacting with them. See, we'd end up with something that met in the middle. We would evolve and the machines would evolve. We'd meet in the middle. And as we see today, that really doesn't happen. People are constantly pushing computers to behave more like them so they don't have to go meet them, meet the computer halfway. Hold. Well, I think, uh, you know, first of all, many people are already hooked up to a computer uh, a couple of hours a day. How do you mean? Uh, through iPod, checking email, oh. whatever. They're, they're, okay. they're essentially, uh, a lot of these questions are already there. Now, they, what I think is more interesting than just this, uh, these numbers is the trends over the years. I'm sure if you did that survey five years ago, the numbers would be much lower, and I'm sure if you do it again in five years, they'll be much higher. So. I think there's a trend, people are being, again, accustomed to these ideas, the advantages, the disadvantages, feeling more comfortable with technology. And so I think these numbers will, will just keep on going higher and uh, it, will, it will happen. Corey. So what I was surprised by in this survey is just how 1980s it was, because it asked a bunch of questions about what you would do with a chip in your brain, and they were all about having access to content, right? A storehouse of knowledge, uh, entertainment material, and so on. And none of it asked what you would do if you had an internet chip that lets you communicate with everyone else, essentially to become telepathic. But you know, the telecoms industry is 100 times larger than the entertainment industry because conversation is king, content is, and content's just what we talk about. So uh, it, 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 I was really struck by this. This was a very 80s futuristic view when we thought that the uh, internet would be about delivering 500 channels of high definition television, not about delivering 6 billion human beings uh, at the click of a mouse. Um, I also wonder what would happen if you asked the same question of people who had incipient Alzheimer's. Um, <laughs> that that you know, maybe when you've got a lot to lose, you, you might not take the risk, but if you came up to someone and said, well, you know, you're, you're, you probably will be delusional in, in five years, would you have a chip now that might extend that by 10, 15, or 20? I that think you might go for. You get a very different answer. Yeah, yeah. I bet you're right. Eliezer. Um, I think that there's a great deal of good that can be accomplished in the short to midterm with uh, computer augmentation, but in the long run, um, I don't think it's our destiny to, as it were, merge with the machines, um, because that's not quite the best way to go. Uh, I don't want to merge with my toaster oven. Even if I wanted <laughs> the ability to make bread, to toast bread, under my own power, with my own strength, without any sort of external assistance being involved, um, I would, you know, it would still take a whole lot of very delicate biotechnology to build the toaster power into my hand. I couldn't just sort of find an existing toaster and merge with its essence, taking it into myself. And in pretty much the same sense, um, you know, the, the human brain is immensely harder to work with than a computer chip. It's not end user modifiable. It's this um, gigantic mess of spaghetti code with no documentation. <laughs> But if with a powerful enough artificial intelligence, it could perhaps figure out what, what actually figure us out, figure out what actually goes on in here and design an upgrade path for us. But it would be, you know, this special, carefully designed human upgrade path um, you know, that uh, can make us smarter without driving us insane or making us very uncomfortable. You wouldn't just take some existing artificial intelligence off the street and merge with it. Let's make this our last question tonight. We've got a few minutes to tackle this. Do you agree? Whether we embrace or whether we fear this future, we may be nearing the end of our natural evolution. Hood, what do you say to that? Well, I think it's not a binary thing. It's not going to happen at some point. It's yes or no. It's gradually. Uh, we are the, the, the merits of evolution, the driving forces of evolution are gradually changing. It's not going to happen overnight, but certainly selection pressures are different. 
uh, today. Uh, what is evolving is different things. Ideas are now uh, maybe what's evolving more than the physical self. There are, uh, there are lots of things that are evolving and it's not gonna happen overnight, but it's gonna be different, no doubt. Michael? I, I don't agree that, the, that we're reaching the end of natural evolution. I think we're biological beings fundamentally. Our, I don't agree that emotions would be so easy to simulate. They're made up of biochemical processes. So what I ate today, what, what kind of cold medication I, came, I took before I sat down here tonight, all have this influence on my emotions and cognition, and, and that's what makes us human. And uh, the machines, the robots, the artificial intelligence are, are simply tools that we use to, to do work for us. Eliezer. If I can uh, take a moment to put things in perspective, about uh, 3.8 billion years ago, we had the start of life, and there might have been some, you know, it's convenient to talk about a single self-replicating molecule, although that's probably not quite how it happened, but if you looked at the very first replicators, they'd be really crude by the standards of a modern bacterium. What was important about the first life wasn't that it was incredibly sophisticated, powerful life, but that it was first. And in a similar sense, we ourselves are significant in the universe because we are the first intelligences. And the first intelligences had to evolve because that's how you get out of the chicken and egg dilemma of where does an intelligence come from if there's not another intelligence around to design it. Well, now we are here. And so I do agree that this is one way or another the uh, end of the era of natural selection and the beginning for the first time of the era of intelligently designed intelligences. That's very interesting that you use the expression intelligent design. For the intelligently first time. designed. <laughs> For because the first time, you, you mind you. It didn't work like that before. You know in your country that, that expression has a whole other meaning. Well, I, I, indeed, um, I, th I think that there's um, a, a very noticeable distinction between things that are intelligently designed and things that are not intelligently designed. And the, the evidence from science and the experimental study of human stupidity would seem to indicate, no offense, that we are not intelligently designed. <laughs> okay, Corey, take the last minute on this. I don't really know what non-natural selection would mean. I mean, clearly we are natural entities and clearly we've helped select each other for millennia. Um, so much of the selective pressure on, on human beings isn't predation, it's uh, reproductive pressure. It's trying to outcompete other human beings for the opportunity to mate, for example. And, and that's been an enormous pressure against uh, our, our, uh, our, our evolutionary history we continue to exert pressure against each other and against the things that we make in a completely natural way because we are part of the natural universe. Um, and, and, you know, we may design things that come after us, but those, those things will embody the cognitive blind spots that are our own heritage, uh, they'll, that'll embody our, 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 um, our biases towards confirmation, they'll embody our blind spots about loss as opposed to gain and so on because they'll have come from us. Um, because, because as much as we know that they're there, we can't unsee them, we can't undo them, and they inform every movement of our hand. So we are natural selectors ourselves. Corey, you're going to get the last word tonight. A uh, wide shot, if we can, Michael, on our four guests. I want to thank Corey Doctorow, Hod Lipson, Michael Belfiore, and Eliezer Yudkowski for an utterly fascinating conversation about the future of artificial intelligence and robotics tonight. Thanks so much to you four. Thanks so much to our audience who came out once again tonight in big numbers here at the Perimeter Institute. Great to have